Welcome to the meeting. I'm Wilfred Otten, Professor of Soil Biophysics at Cranfield University and past president of the British Society of Soil Science. So following our previous two meetings, I'm very pleased that you can join us at the third Zoom into Soil event. Before I welcome our two speakers, I would like to invite Dan Evans to give a brief introduction about the society and the host and today's meeting. Dan, over to you. Thank you, Wilfred. The British Society of Soil Science is an established international membership organisation and charity committee uh, to the study of soil in its widest aspects. We bring together those working within academia and have a growing membership amongst practitioners implementing soil science and industry and those with a keen interest in soils. Next month, we won't be running a Zoom into Soil event, but we'll be highlighting the importance of soil to teachers and students in a virtual event hosted by Lord Lucas, and we'll be sharing the details on that uh, on our social media channels shortly. Our final event this year will be our annual conference, Soil in Action, which will take place on Friday the 4th of December, and that will focus on the links between academic research and industry. And amongst the fantastic programme, we have a forensic scientist and an environment manager from a major infrastructure company sharing their thoughts on the role that soil plays in their work. The conference is available free of charge for our members of BS Cubed. And to find out more about the membership, which starts at £31 per annum, please highlight this in your response to the event survey. Next year, we'll be running 10 Zoom into Soil events, these events, and I hope that you'll join us from January 2021. So thank you for attending today, and I'll hand now back to Wilfred. Thank you very much, Dan. So before we begin this session, a few basic housekeeping. Uh, as there are so many of you today, all microphones have been muted. You probably have already noted that. We will be taking questions, however, at the end of both presentations, and my colleague Dan will ask these on your behalf. So please, could you submit any questions you have by 12.50 to allow us to get through as many as we can and organize them. Although there is a raise your hand button, we won't be using this unless the presenter specifically asks you to raise your hands. Today's presentation has also been awarded BASIS and NROSO CPD points. If you are registered, registered with either body, please contact us directly after the event. Finally, please be aware that we are recording today's presentation. I would now like to introduce our first presenter, Hannah Cooper. Hannah is a research fellow at University of Nottingham, where she previously on the Tucker PhD. Her research interests predominantly focus on the impact of climate, vegetation, and soil processes on the cycling of carbon and nutrients and quantifying trace gas fluxes to the atmosphere in a variety of terrestrial ecosystems. Hannah's earlier research focused on tropical peatland ecosystems. Through a fieldwork campaign in Kuala Selangor, Malaysia, she and her colleagues assess the impact of conversion from peat swamp forest to oil palm plantation on greenhouse gas emissions and the stability of tropical peatland carbon in work recently published in Nature Communications. Anna, we are very pleased that you are willing to share your views with us today about till or no till and over to you. Hi Wilfred, thank you very much for the introduction and for inviting me to speak today. Uh, can everyone see my screen? So the topic it. of my talk today, yeah perfect, <laughs> so the topic of my talk today is to till or not to till. And this is focusing mainly on my PhD research, where I looked at the effects of zero tillage and conventional tillage on a whole suite of soil properties, 
and the potential implications of this for climate change mitigation within the area that I sampled. So just a bit of a background. So what do I mean when I refer to conventional tillage and zero tillage? So conventional tillage is also known as ploughing, and this is where a farmer will have a sequence of several passes across the same field to create a good seedbed and mechanically destroy any wheat. Now, during this process, uh, the mechanical loosens maybe the top 20, 30 centimetres of the soil. However, at the same time, as we learned from gain session last time, this can cause huge problems for soil erosion. So in the 1930s and 40s, the term coined conservation agriculture was introduced. Um, there are three principles of conservation agriculture, and that is that uh, less than 25% of the soil surface is mechanically disturbed. Uh, there's permanent plant residue on the soil surface and some form of intercropping slash rotation. So my PhD focused on the extreme end of this conservation agriculture, which was zero tillage or no tillage. And that's where the farmer will pass over the field maybe once or twice and not disturbing the soil at all and just directly drilling into the previous crop residue. So there are quite a few things that we know about zero tillage already. Because you're only passing over the field maybe once instead of several times, there's a reduced fuel and labour cost associated with zero tillage. You leave a permanent crop residue on the surface, so that gives your soil some protection from wind erosion. And at the same time, you have soil moisture conservation as well, because that crop residue on the soil surface, it really retains that water, which will slowly infiltrate down through your so soil profile, which is really important in the summer months. And lastly, you get an increase in biological activity as well. So some recent work done by Jackie Stroud at Rottenstead showed um, the increase in earthworm populations associated with zero tillage. Uh, there's special earthworms, which are really deep burrowing earthworms, which are important in zero tillage. And they can go down to two meters and their uh, earthworm channels can be left to develop. So zero till adoption across the world, you can see there's been a variety in uptake since it was introduced. In North and South America and Canada, you can see there has been quite a high uptake in adoption. So for example, in Argentina, at least 70% of the arable land available is in some form of conservation agriculture. And this is primarily due to the policy implications. Um, so there's uh, subsidies for farmers, there's meetings every year where at least 2,000 farmers uh, meet, so there's good dissemination of information. However, if you look at the other extent, so on the African continent, where data is available, the uptake hasn't been quite so high. And this is primarily due to the completely different types of farming out there. So a lot of the farming is subsistence farming. So um, the farmers need the crop residue at the end to, uh, for animal feed or for fuel. So uptake has been relatively lower across Africa. So there's quite a few benefits that we know about zero tillage. It's generally, it's good for soil health, um, but there's still quite a few things that we don't know when it comes to zero tillage. So firstly, nitrous oxide emissions or N2O. So we know zero tillage can reduce your carbon dioxide emissions because it's not being mechanically disturbed. Um, it doesn't, the oxygen doesn't get into the profile and oxidize the carbon into carbon dioxide. However, zero tillage does also create a perfect environment for an increase in nitrous oxide emissions. Now, nitrous oxide is about 300 times more potent than carbon dioxide. So in terms of your greenhouse gas balance, which uh, management is better? Zero tillage, which may reduce CO2 but increase N2O, or conventional tillage, which um, has a lot of CO2 but less N2O. Heavily debated in the literature as well is carbon sequestration. So um, some studies only go down and measure to 30 centimetres. But we all know that root systems do go below 30 centimetres to store carbon and release root exudates and things. Also, some studies don't take into account the bulk density changes that you get associated with zero tillage and conventional tillage. So some studies may have um, overestimated the potential of zero tillage to store carbon. 
And also crop yield, this is a big one in terms of a lot of this literature suggests that maybe crop yield declines within the first five years of converting to zero tillage. And in terms of global food security and uh, economy for the farmers, this just isn't feasible. So the first experiment of my PhD uh, was based in the East Midlands and I went to 160 fields. So within these fields were 80 pairs of conventional and zero tilled fields. And this image here on the right is what I mean by a pair. So you've got a zero tilled field right next door to a conventionally tilled field. So everything is exactly the same, the soil texture, the amount of rainfall, the air temperature. But the only difference is the management in which the soil is under. And the image in the middle you can see here, I went to, I never took more than three pairs from each farm. So these are the locations of the different farms and I went to 32 farms in total. Sampling took place across November, December time. So that was lovely and warm. And um, this was when um, one to two months after sowing had been completed. So the structural changes um, associated with root growth were at a minimum. Some of the um, sampling and methods involved, I took an intact soil core. So that goes down to about 30 centimeters, five centimeters wide. And then these were carefully taken back to the lab and uh, measured using X-ray computed tomography. So if anyone's ever broken a bone and gone to hospital, it's basically the same principle in that X-rays go through the sample and there's a detector at the end to see what's been absorbed or where the X-rays have gone straight through. From these same cores, I could then incubate them at 5, 10 and 15 degrees to get greenhouse gas emission potentials. And we also measured carbon stocks, taking into account the changes in bulk density and down to 50 centimetres. So here we've got some examples, some results. So firstly, soil structure. So on this image here, this is an example of a pair of cores. So they're taking no more than 10 metres apart. But even with the naked eye, you can see there's going to be huge structural changes associated with the two managements. And through X-ray CT, we can see um, the different structural changes. So the grey material is the soil material, and then the red is the soil pore. And you can see here, this is a conventionally tilled soil where it's been mechanically disturbed and turned over. It's mainly full of pore spaces, which are going to be a problem when it comes to soil erosion. There's nothing holding the soil together. We then look at zero tilled soils. Again, this is a pair, so taken just a few meters away, you can see a huge difference. You've got your root channels and your biopore channels here, which have been left to develop over time. But what does this mean in terms of implications for farmers? So I also measured something called surface connected porosity. So if, say for example, you have a root channel which starts at the surface and goes halfway down your core. Um, this pore is connected to the surface in some form, so that's what it measures. This is an example of a conventionally tilled core. You can see the total porosity is quite high, about 17%, and the surface connected porosity is limited to maybe the top four centimetres. One year under zero tillage, and the story actually looks a little bit worse. You've got soil which has been consolidated for a year, it's not had that mechanical turnover, and total porosity actually declines. But give the soil seven years under zero tillage and you start to see a kind of regeneration of the soil structure and the so surface connected porosity increases and you can see it moving further down the soil core. And then again give it 15 years under zero tillage and you can see a huge improvement and this is going to have implications for farmers in terms of infiltration and gas exchange. I also measured um, soil carbon. So one thing that was fortunate in terms of sampling so many fields, I was able to get a range of soils which had been in zero tillage for a different length of time. So some had been in zero tillage for one year, some had been in zero tillage for 15 years. Um, and this is often a discussion 
that's not had is the temporal effect because obviously soil changes are slow processes to happen. So if we have a look here at soil carbon, you can see after one to five years, there's no real difference between the two managements. But give it six to 10 years, and because you've got that crop residue left on the soil surface, there was a significant difference in the surface carbon content between the two managements. Give it 11 to 15 years, and there was a significant difference between 0 to 10 centimetres and 10 to 20 centimetres and overall throughout the whole profile down to 50 centimetres there it meant that zero tillage did actually store more carbon than the conventionally tilled soils but how was the carbon stored in the soil so some literature suggests that even though zero tillage may store more carbon in the surface is that going to be readily oxidized and turned into CO2 after a heavy rainfall event or something like that? So a quick and easy analysis I undertook was FTIR. And this looked at the organic chemistry of the carbon stored within the soil profile. So if you look at this image here on the left, this is um, the pairs which have been in zero tillage for one to five years. Zero tilled soils have got the dashed line and conventionally tilled soils have got the solid line. And you can see that there's no difference between the um, different types of carbon that's stored in the soil. After six years, the uh, pairs of zero and conventionally tilled soils, you can see a bump here and there was an increase in the aliphatics. And these are associated with labile forms of carbon. So these are readily available to your earthworms, your microbial organisms to use. And then moving over to this side, you can see an increase in ethers, which are compounds of intermediate recalcitrant. So the soil is starting to hold on to that carbon a little bit more. And again, after 15 years, you can also see an increase in aromatics which are enhanced microbial stabilization of organic materials. So it's gonna take a lot of movement or a lot of activity for that carbon to be accessed and turned into carbon dioxide. So then I also looked at greenhouse gas emissions because if the overall carbon content was increasing in the samples that I measured, what's happening to the greenhouse gas emissions? So I measured carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxide. And using those three, you can create something called the global warming potential. So it takes into account the potency of each gas. And you can see a really interesting trend that's been driven out through doing this. So if we take an example of 15 degrees, uh, one to five years, there's no real difference between the two treatments. After six to 10 years, the zero till soils had a 30% low lower global warming potential than their paired conventionally tilled soils. So the larger global warming potential, the worse that is for your environment. And again, after 11 to 15 years, there's now a huge difference. And the global warming potential coming from the zero tilled soils is actually 70% less than those paired conventionally tilled soils. And because I'd measured them at the increments of 5, 10 and 15 degrees, we can also look at something called temperature sensitivity. And it gives you something called a Q10 value, which shows the soil respiration after a 10, 10 degree increase in temperature. So this is starting to look at the future of the soil. So under future climate warming, how are the soils going to react under these managements? So in the one to five years here, you can see there's no difference in the Q10 value between the soils. But in figure B here, this is again after 11 to 15 years, and you can see the conventionally tilled soils are reacting a lot more to an increase in temperature. So at 15 degrees, you can see here, the zero to Q10 is quite low. So that means an increase in temperature the amount of greenhouse gases that the soil is going to release isn't to the same magnitude as the conventionally tilled soils here. And again, that's due to the carbon being held on a little bit tighter than what we, in the FTIR data we saw earlier. But then I also looked at what is driving 
these gases in these soil columns. So because we were be able to scan the columns and do greenhouse gases on exactly the same sample, we can link the soil structure and other properties to the gas emissions. So you can see here the methane and carbon dioxide are dominated mainly by structural properties. And you can see here that the detectable soil porosity measured using X-ray CT accounted for 38% of the carbon dioxide fluxes. Whereas on the other hand, N2O fluxes were governed more by substrate availability and soil moisture content rather than the soil physical characteristics. So this could be something quite interesting in terms of future management of zero tillage. So yes, N2O might be a little bit higher from zero tilled soils. But in this example here, from my results, nitrate accounted for 10% of N2O fluxes. So if we have maybe slightly better management of nitrate in terms of uh, timing of inputting fertilizers, the right amount, et cetera, we might be able to bring the N2O fluxes down even further from zero tilled soils. So that was a little snapshot of what I got up to during my PhD and here's a graphical abstract. Um, so we know already that zero tillage increases your earthworm population and these are really beneficial in creating your surface connected pores here which also help break through the plow pan that's been established through conventional methods. You've got a different range and more of the carbon stored in your soil here. And the global warming potential is significantly greater from the conventionally tilled fields. So the higher the global warming potential, the worse that is for your environment. But after 15 years, this temporal effect, 70% reduction in your global warming potential. Now, of course, with any experiment, there's caveats. So I was able to carry this experiment out over November, December, because our question was to look at the soil structure. However, for the gases, of course, you need seasonal measurements as well in year round static gas chambers. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to get crop information um, in terms of yield from all of the farmers. So I didn't have a complete data set. But again, that's an extremely important component that needs to be looked at with zero tillage. So thank you for your time. I'll hand you back to Wilfred and look forward to your questions. Okay, Hannah, thank you very much for, I think, a very interesting and nice presentation. And thank you also for literally showing us the inside of soil. That was very nice and very spectacular differences. <laughs> So we'll be taking questions at the end of both speakers, as mentioned before, but please start typing your questions so we can start identifying the most uh, 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 common questions that are being asked by you. I'm very pleased now to introduce our next speaker, Russell McKenzie. Russell is a farm manager for John Shear Farms on the Cambridgeshire Bedfordshire border, a predominantly heavy clay soil type across 995 hectares four units of cropping, including winter wheat, oilseed, rape, winter beans, spring wheat, spring barley, and spring oats. A 2040 Nuffield scholar researching success with no-till under any conditions saw him travel to Australia, New Zealand, United States, Brazil, Argentina, to visit some of the best no-till practitioners in varying extreme of climate to gain a better understanding of how to make no tillage work in both wet and arid climates. Following his scholarship, Russell has been introducing no till practices across the farms he manages. Russell also sits on the cereal and oil seat board for AHDB as a grower member and attended the no till on the Plains Conference in Wichita, Kansas back in January to further research the benefits of conservation agriculture. Uh, be very interesting to hear your side of the story. Russell, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Wilfred, for that introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to come and speak to you today. Um, but also, equally, it was great to listen to Hannah, who did come and do a study on our farm as well. So it was great to see her results off the back of it and uh, some really interesting stuff. So mine's going to be slightly different though. I'm going to sort of do a bit of a review of what I describe as farming's and as horribles from last year. So 
a really, really difficult season. We had a, a very wet autumn last year and then a very dry spring. And I found it quite ironic that I spoke at a few meetings last spring in sort of January, February time. I was reflecting on where we were with the weather and how we've seen things change. And uh, something's really sort of flagged up in terms of what we've seen changing from a period of 1961 to 1990 and then the weather recordings from sort of 2000 to 2015 onwards and at the time in January after that wet autumn we would sort of experienced I was talking about the chance of a, a dry spring and summer increasing fourfold from perhaps one year in 20 to one year in five and also during that period of time we'd seen August getting um, sort of 23% wetter and April nearly 28% drier so two really key months in the farming calendar so in the spring you're looking to get crops established well and growing well, trying to maximise growth time and then trying to get the crop in. Um, I think it was quite ironic when I was standing in the meeting and people were looking quite quizzically when I was talking about the possibility of a dry April when we were looking at waterlog fields, uh, lots of fields at field capacity. Um, I'd say I was a bit of a prophet. I don't think I am. Um, but I had no idea how true those words would, would become. And so if we sort of reflect on sort of what during that season, um, I think back to last autumn, I would only describe we probably had in our area available dry drilling windows for winter wheat and winter barley between sort of September the 22nd and October the 31st. And when we talk about available dry drilling days, that's was allowing the soil to become dry enough to travel on in the first place. And then by the time we got to the 31st of October, that was pretty much shut the doors at that point then. And there was no windows really for us to try and get on. So um, really quite challenging. And obviously that had a knock on effect in, in terms of our cropping. We were probably 62% drilled on our, on our winter wheat um, area. And then obviously the, the rest was made up with, with more spring cropping than we'd like, but you can't help the season. And ironically, if you look at our rainfall records, if you look at those in isolation, uh, we probably averaged somewhere around about 160 millimetres last year. Normally would be somewhere between 480 to, to 560. So the actual total rainfall didn't look too different, but the problem with it really was is that a third of that came between October and December. So a lot of our very short period of time um, and then the ironic bit about it was was the drought we had then from mid-March so we were sort of fairly wet through to February got into middle of March and then no real proper significant rainfall again till harvest so pretty much mirroring what I'd expected to or, or what I'd been talking about during the winter I, I didn't think it would come true and I have heard it sort of said that sometimes you can you can get sort of two years of droughts in a row but it's been a, a difficult year this year for, for crop establishment and, and crop growth and on the whole it's challenging but hopefully there's been some interesting bits that have, that have really come out of that during that period as well and sometimes it, it really does come down to what's sort of your soil in and, and certainly with with sort of no tillage and I think it's really interesting in Hannah's presentation where you can see that difference in soil going forward over that period of time is that you can do get your soils in a really good condition with a good bit of attention to detail but it's understanding what the problems are with it and this is a great couple of pictures here which illustrates probably what we're talking about in terms of how you react to you know where the problems are in soil so we had a lot of like in which we see on the front screen here water sitting on the surface now this is really interesting this one this is this isn't my field but one next door to one of ours and what they've done is they've the cultivated the soil it's really really fine on the top we had those heavy rainfall uh, periods in, in august and the water sitting on the top see where it's consolidated together run together probably too much fine material at that point there which blocks those soil pores and I could find going around in, it in a lot of positions that any problem areas weren't too deep so once you dug through into the soil profile anything below somewhere depending on where they were seven to ten centimeters the structure was pretty good so the problems have been in the in the top surface and sometimes it can be man-made and this next picture is a, is a good example here this is a, a spring barley field now that the problem here you can see there's plenty of wheel marks you know they're, they're virtually a tract width going all the way across. Um, you know, spring barley is pretty sensitive to compaction, um, as are other crops, but really shows that there's there's problems in that field. But the interesting thing for this reflection of, of last autumn, where you know the opportunity to, to cultivate and drill wasn't there on this particular field. Um, this is a, a contract farm which we, we went on to, and what they've done, they just direct drilled in the spring. Now, with direct drilling, it's not a cure to if your soil isn't in the right condition in the first place and, and sometimes you, you've got to build up to that level to, to allow yourself to interesting thing with this one the problem with this field goes back to two years beforehand where there was a, a wet period in the autumn cultivating with a a sort of a, a disc and packer type combination when the soil is at a really plasticky level and what it's done it's got that shallow level of compact so when the roots are hitting that point they can't get through 
but it just goes to illustrate sometimes just no till on its own isn't a cure for soil problems and sometimes you have to maybe look at it and, and do a bit more remedial action in, in situations this is a, a really great picture and um, this was a, a soil pit which we uh, many of you have probably heard me speak before i've shown this a, a number of times i think it's a, a great picture um rob simmons from cranfield came out and we had a look at our soils back in 2017 when we we're part of the monitor farm program um, you can see here classic heavy clay on that bit underneath on that's a layer there and then we've got that nice structure on the top surface the, the really interesting bit the the red straws are the the deep burrowing wormholes and so what we're looking to try and do is we want to try and maintain that structure um, we see that worm numbers increase again something that hannah's highlighted um, and you do see those numbers sort of build up quite nicely sort of further you go through the process but you know there is a case for sometimes do you need to cultivate sometimes it's a case of remedial action We've had to sometimes, you know, in a couple of situations this year after after that last autumn, I've had to maybe cultivate, you know, not terribly deep, but just alleviate where we've had a bit of a problem. So I guess the question is, you know, you know, when do roots really matter in a in a rotation? Well, all the time if you're in a in a no-till situation, they natural water pumps, you know, in these wetter conditions, they're moving water all the time. They're keeping that soil structure in place, keeping it nice and open, keeping those worm channel opens helps maintain biology. There's an awful lot going on with, with root exudates um, and having that interaction with within roots within a system. Um, and trying to have a, a form of constant cover isn't a bad thing. I mean, there's often a term that sort of you don't want to sort of naked, but I think it's sort of quite appropriate where you're trying to keep soils in good order as well. But are there situations that you need to cultivate? Well, I think it's being dramatic about what you've got. You know, there are extreme situations. Um, some of this sometimes can be man-made compaction like we spoke about in that previous picture where you, you put in a a cold space layer in the wrong conditions um sometimes it may be forced upon you if you're in a, a difficult situation if you've got root crops for example um but cultivations do not create soil structure on their own um they can change aggregation but they don't sort of really influence soil structure and again coming back to that, that first picture we looked at over cultivating creates too many of these sort of fine particles which block the soil pores and sometimes if you've got it too fine on that surface you can, you can see where they've blocked the soil pores and you'll almost have that what I describe as that sort of sort of sponge layer where it will be really, really wet in that top sort of surface where you cultivate it to and dry underneath. So it's really understanding sometimes sort of where the problem is. Um, I thought this would be a good time to have a look at a pole, um, not a pole like that. Um, just out of interest, and you know, you'll, you'll get the answer sort of later on. Just have a look at how you think our crops may have performed last year. Did our no-till crops, for example, were they one tonne of hectare? less than our cultivated crops were they about the same were they half a ton of hectare more um or was the response you know greater than half a ton of hectare more you know we may have had some cost savings there but we didn't always have the yields you know there was a balance between the two but it'd be quite interesting just to see you know what do you think may be the difference and you know how it may have panned out so um i'll leave that poll to run we'll see what the answers come out like and so just reflecting on last autumn if i if i look at where we were so Bear in mind the amount of rainfall we're talking about. We had a lot of, you know, sort of pretty wet soils at, at one point, very limited drilling window. This is a, a good example of, of, of what we really learned about what we're doing. So we established a catch crop here after an all seed rape crop. So we've got a variety of root systems going on. We've got the all seed rape um, volunteer result, um, all seed rape volunteers. We've got uh, Facelia in there. We've got some oats, we've got some mustard as well and the idea being with that is that we like to try and sort of drill a little bit later for black grass control and especially with no-till i found that you need to have good conditions to to drill into and this really helps with those place drilling especially if it if it turns turns wet that it keeps the moisture pumping out keeps the soil structure nice and open and, and gives you machinery so to travel on so this was our last day of drilling uh last autumn on the 31st of october um you know drilling into this sort of cover and I was amazed how well it really went. My father-in-law thought I was nuts doing what we we're doing, but this is seen too. So although it's really wet, you can see they've got some nice sort of structure. And this is a, a field that's in year four of, of no-till. And I thought we were really pushing the boundaries, especially with the weather conditions afterwards to, of how it was going to go. And it's going to be a real test of whether we were doing the right thing and how things were going to pan out. So if we look at how it went through the season, um, and as a, as a grow, there's nothing more satisfying than seeing a, a new crop emerging. And, and this is that crop then emerging towards uh back end of november early december you can see the the residue from the previous catch crop and um, the volunteer will see rape dying away in the background and we've got the wheat popping through and um, this is what it looked just going into january so that the rows are up you can see the residue is still in there 
and by June, um, this is the crop we had. And, and this is probably, I think, one of the, the most reassuring things we had about what we're trying to do was the right thing and, and the, the ability to, to get on in a difficult season and get, and get crops established. But that particular field went on to yield so just about 9.3 per hectare. Our wheat performance on whole was was down probably about 25% uh, this year on a reflection of the season. But we did see in those those situations that where we were actually doing less invasive techniques that actually we were able to take it on better and the crops coped pretty well at the same time. Again, this is another interesting one. So this was a, a direct drill wheat crop after spring oats. We put a brief catch crop in here as well. So we've got oat volunteers. We'd also got um, a catch crop with a mixture of buckwheat and some clover in it as well and drilled into it and established pretty well. And I guess the question is, did it make it, would it have made a difference if we cultivated? Well, this is the result on a field on that same block. So we had three fields within there on a, a 30 hectare block. This particular field we'd, we'd mold drain. So we had to cultivate afterwards to, to level out again. Um, not over cultivated, not particularly fine. But for all intents and purposes, our establishment was really, really compromised in this area with water just being probably held up in an upper surface layer a bit more compared to where we're direct drilling. You can see the patchy nature of, of that crop. And then the difference between the two fields was, was probably about 0.75 tonnes per hectare. Um, now, if I hadn't known we'd mould drained it, I'd say we, we probably, you know, we, we've got a, a, a wet layer, but mould draining there, we, we put the, the channel in to try and get water away. But cultivations in that particular situation for us there hadn't really helped. So quite, you know, quite challenging. And you can see the difference between the two different farms, different situations. But what we were seeing last year that we were getting a, a positive result and it almost less meant a bit more, really. And when you sort of roll those uh, results forward and, and coming back to what we've seen on the poll, um, this is looking at our results from last year. On the last column, we've got winter, we've got winter wheat, spring wheat, and winter beans, and that's the selling price with them as well. I know so all wheat yield averages were just under nine tons per hectare. So although we're down performance-wise, we had a good result compared to our coal-based areas by sort of about 0.81 tons per hectare. And when you multiply that up in terms of that yield difference, that's a, that's a benefit of 144 pounds per hectare. Um, and then the other bonus is so we've got our saving in establishment costs. An operational costs on there as well so you can see some some real benefits so coming from that point there i always felt certainly when it comes to to no-till is that the focus shouldn't be purely on um cost saving from machinery etc that's the bonus that really comes from you know going down the, the road of trying to disturb less and, and improve your soils as well and mirrored again in spring wheat obviously the, the advantage wasn't quite so big but again we saw a, a yield increase on spring wheat and quite a big jump on winter beans and the winter beans was really interesting. So we'd run a, a subsoil through those fields in the autumn and then direct drilled into them in the spring, whereas a direct drilled area, we'd direct drilled only and had a more positive yield result. So you get another season, um, you might not see those differences. And I'm probably expecting it in a more normal autumn where conditions are, are more kind to both systems that those differences probably would, would, be, would be less and are not too different. But I think the key bit here really is that there's often a lot of talk about yield penalties with no-till and, and I guess that's a balance really in terms of if you're sacrificing a, a lot of yield you probably have to question whether it's the right thing but certainly from our experiences that it was a, either on a par um, or, or better um, and if they are slightly below it's not by an awful lot so some really good sort of positives to, to take out of that one um, and I've had cover crops and, and livestock for a number of years now and um, we've got sheep going in here. This is a, a mixture that's got some mustard in it. Um, someone did suggest to me that I was uh, trying to have mustard infused lamb going forward. I think theory, I don't think it probably works out in reality. We've done this before as well, where we've, we've looked at cover crops, which we know they work pretty well. We know the benefits of the roots in the system. We know we're capturing nutrients. We're seeing circa 35 to 40 kilograms of nitrogen captured quite consistently. We're tending to discover that's coming back in sometimes two to three years later in the system. Um, but the question is, is there an advantage to grazing covers or terminating in, uh, mechanically? Um, I think it some flows, sometimes difficult to really see a result from it. But, but this year we did see some noticeable results on those ones. Um, certainly in our spring oats, we saw a, a yield benefit of 0.36 tonne hectare over our, our non-grace covered uh, cover crops where we just spray them off. Um, and then a grazer one where we hadn't, uh, where we just cultivated. And again, in spring barley, we saw a yield benefit of 0.46 tons per hectare over our just purely um, non-cover crop field. So 
I don't always see this result. We've seen this result this year, so it can vary year to year. But it's nice to see some some positive results in uh, in in those terms as well. So really, just to bring it all together and, and a bit of a summary, I think it's it's clear that in, in a really difficult season that, that no still can really help. Um, certainly with catch crops, if you get those right, I think it's important not to get them too thick, but helps you drill into difficult conditions. Almost quite a lot what we're seeing now. And I think if you take the road down the conservation ag base system they really highlight their, their strengths in these sort of wildly variable seasons what we seem to be guessing now they'll hold on that a little bit more in in sort of drier conditions um but you know sometimes you may need to cultivate in, in some situations if you need to correct something uh i've no doubt that cover and catch crops are really helpful for soil condition nutrients and carbon capture um hannah's highlighted brilliantly the what happens within those soils and we've seen their results as well that you know there's a lot you can do with the system uh, and certainly from what I've seen and we've highlighted that you know that yield reduction is, is a bit of a myth if your soils are in the right condition I think it is important to, to be flexible in your approach and not be too fixed on just doing doing one thing and sometimes reacting to these and um, but overall really uh, stable yields fixed and input cost reduction more time to spend what's not to lose. and uh, thank you very much for, for listening. Thank you very much, Russell, for a very interesting presentation and for giving us a, a no-till look from a practical perspective and a positive outlook that you can still make it work on a, a very wide range of uh, what will be challenging conditions. So, as I indicated, we will be taking questions now uh, to both Russell and um, um, <laughs> and Hannah. Sorry. <laughs> um, so. Um, for that, I'll be uh, handing over to my colleague Dan, who's been monitoring the questions. But please, meanwhile, keep your questions coming, type them in, and you'll keep on monitoring them. Um, so I would say, Dan, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Wilfred, and, and thank you to Russell and Hannah for, for stimulating presentations. So I've got a couple of questions uh, for, for you both kind of each um, relating to your particular presentations and then maybe more of a broad discussion. Um, so just heard from Russell. Uh, Russell, in, in your yield analysis, is there any bias that your no-till land may be on better soil? Oh, that's a good question, that one. Um, no there isn't i mean what i i look at all of our, our blocks are the same um yeah we probably have some blocks that maybe perform best than others but when I, I look at our analysis that's everything combined so it, it's looking we've got four different blocks um i've been looking where we've got noted on different blocks you know some may perform slightly better than, than others but that mix is pretty spread and pretty consistent um uh, across all of them so we've got a mixture across all the farms so um what you'll you'll get when I talk about it is, is a pretty honest opinion um, in terms of, of of what we see, um, which I, th I think is really important. You know, we can all show the good results, um, but I think it's pretty good important to be open and honest about what you're actually doing. Yeah, absolutely, of course. And uh, and just one more finally on, on Russell for your particular presentation, we uh, we have a question here uh, about mole drains. If you didn't have mole drains, would you not be able to get onto the land? And do you think you need them with no-till systems? Well, mole drainage is basically the, the idea of the operation is you, you've got land drainage underneath and what the moles are doing is they're creating a channel for the water to get through down to the drain. So those those moles will, even in, in a good season, will only last probably sort of four to five years at most. Uh, and I think for an often sometimes it's a, you, you'll get some wet, wet spots appear and we certainly had some last year and sometimes it's reacting to, to what you've got. So I, I, I think fundamentally, I think it's still... Uh, quite a key operation, especially if you're on on heavy ground um, and, and maintaining those drains, drain systems. It is really important. Well, fantastic. Thank you, thank you, Russell. So we've got a couple of questions now. Then uh, just reflect on Hannah's presentation earlier in the webinar. Uh, so we've got one here uh, about the texture, and there's quite a few questions about the texture uh, in 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 the uh, the panel here. Did you see any differences in your results, Hannah, in relation to the soil type with clay versus sandy soils, particularly in regards to uh, the greenhouse warming potential? Yes, yeah, so majority of the samples were uh, like heavy clay or clay loam, so that made sampling really fun. 
Um, but I did have a look at the differences between the textures. There weren't too many, which were predominantly sandy, but it did seem in the sandy soils. So throughout the webinar, I talked about the time aspect and the regeneration seemed to happen a bit quicker in the sandy soils, I suppose, because you've got those macropores and things naturally developed. It didn't take quite so long for the structure to regenerate. Um, the, I couldn't pull out any significant differences in the global warming potential between the two textures, um, but it did look like sandy soil um, produced more CO2, but it wasn't significant. Fantastic. So um, we can now kind of open out uh, maybe the discussion to uh, to both of you and thinking across your different sites and, and your work. Uh, so we've got one here about climate and obviously very important with climate change. How do you think climate will impact how easy it is to transfer from conventional to zero tillage when we have such extreme weathers such as that in, in 2020? Um. I don't mind going first. Um, so I think it's going to make it a lot harder in terms of farmers just starting out if they want to experiment converting, especially because of the erratic behaviour of the weather. And what I found as well was in the first few years, you do get that surface consolidation. So in terms of waterlogging, that's going to cause huge problems for the farmers. So thinking future and climate change, it might also be an option here now for policy to change as well for zero tillage. So in those first few years where farmers are converting, provide subsidies and things to support them and help them in terms of um, it might be a bad season because of the erratic weather, but keep bearing with it. And the stuff that I've shown after about five, six years, the soil structure does regenerate. Russell, have you got any added thoughts there? Yeah, I mean, I think it is a challenge. I mean, it's it's you know sometimes it can be a bit of a, a leap of faith and and sometimes sort of when you're thinking about sort of changing it's you know trying a trying a bit first and, and, and gaining confidence from there to, to take it further um and hannah's right in terms of the you know or taking you know can sometimes if you've gone from a you know full inversion um deep type based system to a to no-till system it, it can take a little bit longer for it to settle down but if you've been bringing your observation depth sort of shallower and shallower then that that sort of transition can sort of happen a bit quicker so um you know i don't think you probably get much more of a challenge in season than we've probably just had um so i think there's there was an awful lot to be learned from from this season um yeah you know, i wouldn't press we got everything right by any means but um i think there is scope for it to, to really help with stuff but uh, i think if you're just sort of venturing down it um depends how how brave you are and i guess your attitude to risk in terms of, of how much you want to take on but i know when, if looking back when we started um, it was a, you know, a sort of a, a softly, softly approach to you gain more confidence in doing the, the operation. And if I look back at cover crops, the, the first year we grew those, we only had 40 hectares. Um, of course, to learn how best to manage them. And then once you, you learn your various techniques, it makes it easier to, to roll it out onto a larger acre. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Russell and Hannah, for that. Um, so let's think uh, not just about seasons now, but climate change over a longer time period. And, and, and Hannah particularly looked at, uh, at this in her in her work. So uh, regarding greenhouse gas emissions um, and, and specifically N2O emissions, have you any thoughts, Hannah, on, on what you might see if you measured N2O emissions throughout the year? Yeah, so NTO emissions are quite sporadic anyway, um, and especially throughout the year, it depends on fertilizer inputs and things like that. The time at which I sampled, um, that would be the least impact of the fertilizers. And again, so N2O um, is released from soils through two processes, so denitrification and nitrification, which are determined by the amount of water in your soil profile. So I imagine you'd get, so when I sampled, quite a large flux of N2O coming out because the soils are really wet and you've got that substrate availability as well, which is perfect for the microbes. And then I'd imagine probably in the spring and summer, the levels might still might um, go down a bit, but you'd still get N2O production. So that was something I wanted to look at actually in my PhD, but unfortunately ran out of time. But at Rothamsted, they've got the Dennis system which can separate out those two processes. So throughout the year, you can measure um, the predominant factor which is causing that N2O production. So it, it would be some really interesting future work, yeah. 
Russell, have you had any experience with, with N2O emissions uh, in your in your sites there? Uh, well, I mean, a lot of you know some of the information which we've probably seen has actually been you know Hannah's been kind enough to to, to do sort of some of it. So we've seen some of the stuff which is which is going on, um, and that is quite interesting in terms of, of what you can physically capture or what you can what you can reduce capture wise. Um, so I think if you can build up a, a data set for, for that sort of thing, it, it's quite a powerful powerful tool at the end of the day. And it, it might just be that you know there's lots of talk around carbon etc. And if you go across the states, you know carbon trading is something that's you know, spoken about over there and there's systems in place and there's talking about it happening here um but all those sort of things are yeah i think they're starting to come to the fore now so i think they'll they'll be quite interesting going forward brilliant thank you so um we're just uh past our 10 to 1 uh, uh slot here so um uh, thank you for your questions and we'll just uh, look at the ones we've got uh coming in uh, so uh, at this point in time so we've got uh, a series of questions about time and of course um, as, as Hannah showed in her presentation, it, it kind of takes some time for some things to happen in, in terms of the effects of no-till farming. Um, so we've got a question here that, uh, do you think that given even longer time scales uh, beyond 15 years, will no-till farming generate even more carbon sequestration or do you think it reaches a cap at, uh, at some point? Yeah, so there is the term carbon saturation, so the soil can only take in so much carbon. Um, so within the UK samples that I, sites that I went to, the maximum I could find was a farmer who had been zero tilling for 15 consecutive years. So that was the data there that I had to work with. And at that point, it didn't show a, like a carbon saturation point. But I was fortunate enough as well to go over to Brazil for a few times during my PhD through funding through STARS and um, my supervisor's project as well. And there were some farms that I was able to sample and they'd been in zero till for 31 years. And so I did, again did the sequential systems where uh, from recently converted and then I did seven years, 16 years, 21 years and then up to 30 years. And it did seem in those samples after about 18, 20 years, it kind of plateaued. Um, so that was in those samples, but it wasn't possible to measure that in the UK samples because of the availability of um, long-term zero-tilled fields. That must be a difficulty, Russell, as well, the fact that we may be kind of late to the party when it comes to no-till farming here in the UK. Uh, well, to a, de to a degree, I guess it is. I mean, there, there, there has always been a bit of a hangover from when it was originally used in sort of the 1970s and, and early 80s is that, you know, some people experience a very different approach to, to what, what we've, we're doing now. Um, but I think in terms of, you know, there's, there's a thirst for research in it. Um, there's a, a real generating interest with people wanting to understand it. The emphasis is more now on, on soils really as well. Whereas there's a, as it's a really healthy, it's almost, there's lots of information. Um, um, it, you know, once you can't, can't get enough. And it's a, it's a, it's a really, you know, I know I'm sort of speaking to the right audience, but um, there is a real healthy obsession with trying to understand what's going on with soils and what they can do, what they can capture, et cetera. Um, are we a bit late to the party? I, I don't know, there's, there's certain parts of you know probably Europe is probably more challenging because of the climate than it would be if you compare it to sort of the South American countries those are tropical types of the systems out there it's, it's probably maybe a bit easier to adopt out there um you know the UK is challenging but there's some you know there's some brilliant practitioners you know guys that are a lot further down the road than me who are, have learned a lot understanding what the limitations are and I think that's the key bit is you know what are your limitations of how far you can push stuff you know some people would say that actually cover crops don't don't see them so they're not for everyone um and i think that's the key bit with it is it's not a one size fits all approach you know there's a different systems for different farms um different approaches to stuff uh, and, and what works for you really but i think things go in the right direction there's, there's so there's, there's lots of good people doing some really good stuff across the uk yeah absolutely of course and uh, and maybe if we are late uh, to, to this uh, um, and there's a question here particularly about speeding things up would different crops or different practices enhance or speed up the rate at which uh, in particular with this question, optimum soil connected porosity is achieved. Can we speed that process up? Um, yes, I definitely imagine so. So that wasn't the particular focus of my study, but 
um, I don't know if you guys have watched the documentary on Netflix, The Kiss the Ground, but that was brilliant in terms of showing the effectiveness of cover crops speeding up the regeneration. So they used it as an example of um, a farmer had used 16 uh, different species on one field. So you've got 16 lots of different root exudates feeding all these different microorganisms, uh, increasing your earthworm activity. So yeah, definitely more cover crops and creating those root channels which would be really beneficial. Yeah. Then do you see uh, in, in your kind of applied practices, Russell, in, in the fields, are, are there ways that, you know, with your colleagues, of course, ways you can speed up the process uh, or kind of help the, help the process along a bit? Yeah, I think it's, I mean, uh, there isn't a simple sort of, uh, well, a yeah, simple solution is going out and look with a spade, is understanding what, what you've got underneath, I think, is, is the key bit. Um, you know, in terms of how good is your soil structure in the first place, and, and that gives you a good indication of where to go. Um, a, a variety of crops, I think, is you know is, is really healthy. I, I know certainly when I did my Nuffield, there was a a guy in Argentina who spoke about the importance of different root systems, not just within a cover crop, but within the growing crops as well. So you you've got that constant mixture of different roots, different associations. I'm probably still thinking about sort of we were rotation wise 10 years ago it, it was what i call the non-rotation rotation which was wheat and all seed rape or maybe two weeks in all seed rape and the, the challenge you get with that when you have brassicas in the rotation you, you can build your mycorrhizae um association um but there's no association with something like all seed rapes so you can build it and then for that period of time it will drop so you can possibly understand sometimes if you're growing a lot of all seed rape in a very short rotation why something like that is not not healthy for mycorrhizal fungi so, yeah, having different root associations, you know, we, we companion crop with, with Aussie rape as a, for various reasons, you know, see that different root association going on with there. Um, I think, you know, keeping residues, cover crops, you, you can sort of try and move along quickly. Um, I know people talk about soil organic matter, and that's the hard one, is that, that you can't sort of build that overnight. That is a slow process. Um, but you can certainly help it along, along its way a, a bit quicker. Um, and sometimes just being, being a bit brave and being brave, but, but not, but not pedantic, I think is quite important when it comes to just trying to move things on. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, uh, thank you so much to everyone for all of your questions. I mean, there's so many that we can't get through, unfortunately, but I'm sure we can discuss this at a later date uh, in the society. Um, but there is one final question I want to ask, and, and that's uh, quite a, an honest one here. Why is, why is there no consensus on zero tillage? Why is it still a matter of discussion? I think personally what Russell was saying and that you just need to get a spade and see what you're working with it can be really site specific in terms of what you've got to work with um, and in terms of again different climates and things if it's really really waterlogged to start with you're just not going to be able to get zero till to work so it is site specific and you just need to see what you've got really. And Russell? Yeah I'd, I'd, I'd echo that completely it, it really is i mean you could have some fields which just, for, for whatever reason it, it just doesn't work on sometimes um and it, it is sometimes the hard the hard bit is if you've been doing a lot of tillage you know once you once the combine's out the field um you're going out your cold spacing and sort of working stuff down it's probably one of the, the really the hardest things is to sit there and almost do nothing when everyone else is doing stuff around you and wonder what you should be doing um and that that's, that's quite a hard you know it, it can be quite a hard thing sometimes and um having staff on board as well is, is pretty good to try and understand what you're trying to achieve on the journey um and, and what you want to do so yeah and, and it, like i say again it, it's about yeah, it just goes back to just understanding what's going on you know within your fields really and you, you get a pretty good picture pretty quickly um and you know certainly when you listen to some people talk about it they you know I, I can dig a hole but i can't explain what goes on in a, in a hole as well as someone like rob simmons or philip wright will do and it's quite good if you can go to those events where they, where they point out what's going on um you can try and then take it away and understand what's going on in your own fields yeah it just, just shows the importance of, of, of continuing to zoom into soil a uh, little bit more thank you so much to russell and to hannah and uh hand back now to wilfred Thank you all uh, for very interesting in discussions. So on behalf of the British Society of Soil Science, I want to express our thanks to both Hannah and Russell. I've taken a little note, uh, Russell, of your forecast that this was probably the worst year that we can have. And I hope that that's as accurate as your first prediction was. So, 
<laughs> so for the information on, 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 on zero tillage, um, there will be a special issue in the European Journal of Soil Science with an opportunity and challenges in no-till farming. Uh, it will feature 16 newly published papers and it will be available online to journal subscribers. So keep an eye out for that. It will appear shortly. Uh, it will be accompanied by a cross-journal virtual issue of 20 previously published papers together with the uh, uh, Soil Use and Management Journal. And this will be available online free of charge in November and December. So if you're not a subscriber or a member of the society or work with an institution that has got access, these will be freely available to all. Thank you very much for attending. When you leave this uh, meeting, you'll find a quick survey. So we would appreciate if you can give us some feedback and take, uh, uh, we, we will take that into consideration. Uh, the recording of this video will be made available on our YouTube channel as soon as we will be able to do so. We will release details of our 21 meetings on social media, and we hope to see as many of you uh, at those meetings and also at our upcoming annual conference, the 4th of December. Thank you all very much and goodbye.